Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We are at the Hadoop Summit 2015 event, live in Silicon Valley. My co-host George Gilbert with wikibon.org. Our next guest, Herb Kunitz, president of Hortonworks. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Good so to be here you again. are doing all the schmoozing. I saw you out last night at the Hortonworks first cocktail party. A lot of customers here, a lot of partners. Great event. Mm -hmm. How you feeling? You did a bike ride this morning. Yeah, What's going on? Bike ride late at night, up early in the bike ride this morning. It was great. Feeling great. You know what's different about this conference this year than some of the other ones is it's always been a number of companies you see here at the show floor and everything, and the different partners and the different vendors, etc. But this time, almost 50% of the sessions are run by end users. So it's a lot of customers, a lot of customer stories, a lot of end users, and I think it's a reflection of the maturation of the market that there's a lot of customers with stories to tell now. And the sessions are interesting too. That I always look at the sessions. We had talking yesterday with um, you know some of the analysts and guests on. You can always tell a show by the sessions. Mm -hmm. Managing multiple workloads in production. That, that couple of, you know, mm -hmm. had to stand up a POC a couple of years ago. Now, you know, production high grade enterprise deployments are mm -hmm. happening. The other observation that I'm seeing, and I'll get your thoughts on, is a lot of big name enterprises are here. Mm -hmm. The names are bigger. People are saying they're getting more leads from the show. Is that because of the overall growth of big data or Hadoop? How do you guys look at this? Because is this a big data show or is this a Hadoop show? So it's a Hadoop show, but Hadoop is part of the big data ecosystem, okay. right? So you can't. One, you can't do big data without Hadoop, right? Yeah. But if you're doing Hadoop, you actually want to do big data. Yeah. You want to do something bigger and broader, which is how do I get value out of it in the analytics? And I think what you're seeing on the show, in which a lot of the companies, the large companies you described, you know, and a lot of them are talking, companies like Schlumberger or Rogers or Verizon, right? different companies in the customer panel, or Symantec or Home Depot or GE or Optum, United Healthcare Group. Right, what they're all talking about is there's this transformation going on in their industries where the digital supply chain is getting mapped out and then different companies are saying, how do I participate in that digital supply chain and can I re-monetize my business in new ways to take advantage of that because I have all this other data available. And what you're seeing is the early adopters have done that over the last couple of years and now the rest of the early majority, right, got Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm on tomorrow in the keynote and he's talking through, what does it mean to actually cross the chasm as you're in that early majority, and why do these larger companies start okay, to So play? I got to ask you the question, and this has come up in the queue, because since last night, I'm all high-fiving each other. Yeah, we crossed the chasm, everyone's like, rah, rah. But then, I well, we talked to the other people, no, the customers don't see it that way. So I got to ask you, are we high-fiving ourselves that we've crossed the chasm, or do the, and do the customers see us crossing the chasm as, a, as an industry? I think the industry's crossed over, in my mm -hmm. opinion, no doubt. But have we crossed over from a customer consumption standpoint? I'd answer is it there, this or way. is it, or is that irrelevant? No, I think it's actually a very good point because I think from an industry perspective, we would all say we've crossed the chasm, right? Not by a lot, but we're across it. And yeah, we're in that early and we're running, yeah, hard running. But hard. if you ask a customer, what does it mean to cross the chasm? They're going to say they've gone through that maturity life cycle. And they have the first project underway. They have the second. They have a shared service or a data lake, and now they have ways to onboard the business and new applications and bring them on and just start creating these new analytic applications. Most companies have not nailed that process. So they have to yet. cross their own chasm. Exactly. So you know, at yeah. least we it's a big one. It's a mini chasm in the chasm. <laughs> For those customers, is there like a common project or one, one or a couple common projects to get those first two before they get to the shared service? It's a great question because there are absolutely patterns that we're seeing. And we've uh, stack ranked how we look at the patterns of the use cases of what th customers that are is doing. Getting, that is literally the, you know, crossing the chasm is mm -hmm. sort of that one bowling pin to get you into the bowling alley. Yep. So if I take the first couple and stack rank, number one is things like ad serving. Right, how do I serve ads more in the power of one to an individual okay. across the, as opposed to spamming them across a broad group? Right, two would be archiving or offloading other data sources, data warehouses, other things, and can I do that more cost effectively? Three would be building a predictive analytics application to go predict behavior like preventative maintenance. Right? I'll give you an interesting example. We were, uh, last week we were keynoting at the TU Automotive Show, and you'd say, well, what's that? It's telema <coughs> telematics and automotive. 
And that, if you think of their digital supply chain, how do I capture all the data, diagnostic data off a car? How do I transfer it somewhere? Because the car is not going to be the computer. I'm going to analyze it somewhere else. And then how do I make sense of it and provide that data back? And mapping out that digital supply chain, you know, we announced a relationship with Harman, who runs most of the head ends inside of a car and captures that data. And now we can go back to a OEM or an auto manufacturer and say, you're going to have these types of issues on maintenance of the cars based on all the data you're analyzing. You can provide this service and tell this individual car driver they're about to have a problem because the intake manifold pressure is too high. That's an early app? That's a That's the type of thing that they're starting wow. to do now. Absolutely. Wow. That digital supply chain, now they can deliver a new service, which is not I'm buying the car just because I want you know six cylinders in this. I'm buying it because I'm getting better service back. I love the digital supply chain analogy. Rob brought this up yesterday in, in his talk on theCUBE about comparing inflection points with the wealth creation, value creation. You know, I was talking about TCPIP, he brought up ERP, which absolutely changed the mm -hmm. game during the mini computer days That's and created true. a ton of money for people to make money, vendors, customers, people happy. Um, in manufacturing, CRM, we, it's all still existing today. Um, so digital supply chain, I got to ask you, that is a really big deal. So how does a company succeed, because Sean and I just talked about it, Sean Connolly, about the difference between tools and platforms in this new mm -hmm. era, because what you just described is, I can come in with an app and be successful, and then platform builds underneath it, and I have all this open source underneath it as well, mm -hmm. so that you can be successful with an app today, and Hadoop has got a lot of use cases. Mm -hmm. So how is this new platform and tooling going to resonate in this new supply chain, because is there one Boilerplate, is there a reference architecture? Every company's different, so their digital supply chain will hence be different. So what does the tooling and platform have to do for the customer as they retrench or retool or replatformize? So I would say we've seen this, we've seen history play over multiple times, right? Rob yes. said ERP, right? I'm going to go back even further. Think back to the railroads, right? As the railroads were getting established. So what happened? First is everyone had a different platform, different size tracks. And what happened, you couldn't run the railroad on multiple tracks, in this case, the locomotive being the app, because it wouldn't run, and you had to custom build the whole stack. And then suddenly, standardization across the tracks came through, and then all these new apps, different types of locomotives, different types of cars, freight car, engines, yeah. et cetera, all became possible. Different payload, data. It. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, you're right yeah. on. Yeah. And that's, this is playing out the exactly the same way. As the tracks are getting standardized, which means the platform is being established, now you can build these new apps on top of it to a consistent pattern. That's when the innovation unlocks yeah. in the ecosystem. This is awesome. I'm going, he's going right where I want you to go. So Herb's, um, um, Merv's um, report, mm -hmm. half class, full, all this new stat shows that 50% of the enterprise are considering Hadoop. So if you actually take the example of doing a little app on the standardization of say Hadoop, then all enterprises will eventually be doing it. So the numbers might be a little bit light, but there's a distinction between rolling out an app with Hadoop versus enterprise-wide. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing in the numbers, um, and from our data, and also Sean uh, collaborated, as well as Del Vecchio did on the keynote, which is, you guys are winning at the large enterprise. Mm -hmm. Explain that, explain how on a huge enterprise process where the decision is company-wide, where there's been a lot of land and expand, organic flowers blooming, a la Apache software vision, inside the enterprises. Right. And which then, they rein in, and so why are you guys winning in that bigger deals? And is the battleground the little deals or <laughs> the big deal? Because now, if you, if you take that forward, I'm an enterprise, I got nine versions of stuff going on, I got to rein it in. Mm -hmm. Is that where we are, and then, are you seeing that? Because you guys are getting hitting the numbers on the high end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just you, know, you just look at raw metrics, I had a number of new customers were closing in a quarter, last quarter was 105, right? Quarter before it was 99. And while we're proud of that, the reason is probably threefold as to why we're doing well in that space. One, customers want to work with something that's open because they want to be able to participate and contribute to it. And they want to know that it's not a walled off garden, but it's something that they can participate in. Right? So that's one, they want it open, in this case open source. Right, second is they want more of a partnership. They don't want trickery too, right? So like they want to see everything, right? They, they want, want to know it. They want pure transparency. They want to see what it is, and they want to say, if I want to help, I have the ability to help you on that. And I don't have to do some special thing to go do that, I just need to train my people. Right? Second is they want more of a partnership. I think the industry wants less of a product and more of a partnership. And partnership's an overused term, 
But what they really want to say, can you come in and help me figure this out? And I'll give you an example. A customer the other day said, I actually don't want to go stand up a platform or product. I want you to deliver this to me as a service, which means it's outcome based. And at the end you say, yeah. I'm successful because I have this outcome. That's how we're going to measure success. That's a part of it. Yeah, the Presto project is impressive because we were talking about that Presto project, how that came out of Teradata Labs, and it's like, why would you buy Teradata when I just want to do an experiment? Mm -hmm. I'll uh, figure it out first before I double down. Um, okay, great. No, so back to the enterprise question. I want to get drilled down yes. on one more, one more point there. Why, though, are you guys winning these large enterprise deals, company-wide? Is it because of those three, only those three things, or is it because that's the way the customer wants to buy? They, are they buying one vendor? Do they want to have multi-vendor? Why Hortonworks? Why are you winning those top deals? So typically the, the pattern actually goes very traditional software of land and expand. Customer starts and they'll start small. They want to get success, success. they want a proof point, and they may actually have multiple platforms in place, multiple railroad tracks yeah. when they get started. <laughs> Then they realize that's not going to be as efficient, so they say, I need to standardize to one. And when they standardize to one, they say, I'm going to go bet on somebody for probably the next decade to run my data architecture. Yeah. Who do I feel more comfortable from a partnership? And if it's more open, do I have the ability to participate? And do I have comfort that somebody's not going to come back to me later and say, ha ha, now you have to go buy I think X. Red Hat really nailed that. I don't want to bring up Red Hat to try to compare you guys to Red Hat because I think that's an overdu overused cliche. You're the Red Hat of, uh, of Hadoop. I mean, I just said it, so I really <laughs> kind of killed myself on that. But <laughs> they nailed the support by having the 10-year RHEL support. Mm -hmm. They support their software for a decade. Every enterprise I talk to says that's a lock spec mm -hmm. because they love it. Mm -hmm. They like the support. Yeah, they want the support. They need the support. You know, and for us, as long as we keep leading and driving the innovation at Hadoop, and this becomes a platform that keeps accelerating, people want and need that help, right, to stay current and help participate. But Red Hat actually is facing it now a, a transition where every enterprise needed their support, and you know the the network was brilliant. But when you're a cloud provider, you don't need that Red Hat network to update, you know, the bits mm -hmm. on on every running instance. When when you're in the cloud, how does the model change? Mm -hmm. When you want to, you know, keep the tooling so that it's really simple to operate and and to develop against, you know, the Red Hat has a whole different value prop they have to worry about in the cloud. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'd say we've chosen a model that says we want to make it transparent to a customer. They want to run on premise, in the cloud, bare metal, virtualized, appliance, <laughs> however they want to do it make it ubiquitous that it's the same bits that they can go operate on, leverage, and get success from. So we're given the ability to go run in the cloud on our partners like Microsoft Azure, right. Right, or others, where they want to go run their business up there, and that's fantastic. And they get the same level and quality of service that they would whether they run on premise. And, and Red Hat can deliver that same experience, and I, I guess what I'm getting at then is, it's more of a, an economics issue. Mm -hmm. like would the economics to you be the same when you're putting it on Azure, where the customer, um, well, where Azure can be more self-sufficient in updating all the bits and making sure it's simple to run and they put their own tooling around it, mm -hmm. you know, to simplify it. Azure can be more self-sufficient from the way you described, but if somebody still wants to leverage Hadoop as a analytics service, uh -huh. right, in this case, and go get value out of it, yeah. they typically want support on it, and you know, candidly, we provide support to Microsoft, right, as part of our relationship on things like HD Insight, which is what they're running right. about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Herbert, I'll ask you the inflection point question sure. because Sean gave us his fuzzy math around the Oracle. The elephant in the room. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, the Oracle did this in five years, but it, it makes sense, I totally buy it. But you know, the numbers might be different with accelerated economics or whatnot with the cloud. But the inflection point I, I buy is here. And one of the reasons why I think it's uh, an inflection point from a different vector would be the cloud power, the cloud right now is exploding, not public cloud, hybrid private in mm -hmm. the enterprise, which changes the data center. So I was talking with your, your VP of engineering last night, talking about some of the things you guys are doing, and then it kind of hit, hit me with this question I wanted to ask you. How much of an impact to accelerate the ramp of the inflection points? The inflection point is, where are we on this curve of the inflection point? So now it's a new curve. Is the inflection point going to shape faster? At what angle? Mm -hmm. And we think cloud is going to be a big part of that. Mm -hmm. 
because of the economics, because of the horsepower, because of virtualization, containers, a lot of, a lot of good stuff's happening for app developers. That's good timing for the, what's happening in your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the inflection point going? From a, from I think, a uh, business and scale perspective. Yeah, let me answer the cloud question and come back to what I think may drive the inflection point. Yeah, so on the on the cloud side, I want to provide choice, right, as I go describe. And we see on the cloud this concept of data gravity, which you know, Sean and others may have mentioned that data born in the cloud tends to stay in the cloud, data born on premise tends to stay on premise. So if you ask a large enterprise who runs most of their data on premise, they're probably going to keep it there for now. They may burst analytics workloads into the cloud and start to get into a hybrid cloud, but they're probably not pushing wholesale there yet, today, right? Just for other reasons. Yeah, that's just in. But if their you. data's in the cloud, they want to run it there and they want to operate it there. So we're seeing it come from both sides and come together. But now I think to the inflection point of what's driving that, right? again, railroads laid out, platforms getting standardized, now it's how quickly will the market develop applications that can run on top of that platform, on top of the do, yeah. as net new analytics apps and take advantage of it? And that's what the end users, the customers want, is provide me that And they'll app. validate that with checks, signing, consuming the product, mm -hmm. paying for that value. Which drives more usage of the platform. Yeah, so that's the flywheel we're looking for. We're looking for the, the, the transition to consumption, mm -hmm. easy to consume, frictionless consumption. Right. That's why I would look at, you know, as a signal, yeah, I yeah. would look at things like today, like SAP is one of the keynotes, right? SAP owns the transaction data for most, com most companies, decades of it, right? They're participating in this market right, with us now around how can they work together and take those decades of transaction data applications, apply it to the new signals of Hadoop, and provide a new insight to a customer. That's awesome. But does that gravity keep that, that data and and the analytics that'll run on Hadoop, does it keep that on-prem because SAP's on-prem? Or is the preponderance of all that data that you're adding coming from the cloud? So I'll give you an interesting answer and I'll preview something because you'll see the customer panel tomorrow. We did a prep for it last night and I asked them that exact question as we went okay. through it. Five companies, all five said, my data's staying on-premise. Okay. And we went through that exact question to say, would you move it to the cloud, why not? You have this ability. Even if the, cause the contextual data, not the SAP data, but all the stuff you're adding. They said they would rather bring it in bring site it in. and do that here okay. for various reasons of PII, of privacy, of data yeah. protection, okay. right, of that's where their data center is, et cetera. And it could be just FUD for them. It's just the comfort of on-prem even though it may or may not be less more secure. Exactly. I mean, it, it, which you know, is okay. Yeah, I mean, that takes the security argument out of it because you know, we're seeing some pretty good security in the cloud. I mean, there's some cloud stuff out there that with multi-tenancy has nailed some of the security issues, but that's the mindset of the customer. They're the buyer, they write the checks. I, I would argue that the data is just as secure in the cloud as it yeah. is on premise, yeah. just as secure. But to your point, it's more where they're yeah. comfortable that they're doing it. All right, so one of the other themes here, I want to get your thoughts on, and you probably hear this because you're out in the field a lot with customers, is ease of use. We're hearing that theme here, ease of consumption, ease of product. Where's the white spaces that need to be filled to make the overall Hadoop platform easier to consume and maintain the openness, maintain the ODP mission? It, you know, all that stuff's got to kind of come together. What's the areas of work that you see mm -hmm. that needs to be done now to keep it, e get it, make it easier and more elegant? Yeah, I think ease of use probably comes on three vectors that you think about. One is, how do you make it easier for developers to write to the application? Everything we were just talking about, right? ISVs, others, easier to write, what are the tooling, and then can you certify to the platform? And that's one part, right, of what we're working on and others. Second is, for the administrators, can we make it easier for them to operate it and run it? Um, one of the customers who's going to talk tomorrow, he went through and he was asked, you know, what does it take to administer this? He said he thought about it and thought about it and said, you know what, I have 700 nodes and I have two people administering this. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, that's great leverage. Yeah, exactly, it's great leverage. So it's like, how do we make that even easier? Can we get it to one? Like, can we make yeah, that even easier yeah. for them? So that's the second. And the third is, more how do you make it easier for what we'd call the, the technical decision maker to understand what they're getting and what the value is and put the parts together? And that's a lot of working with the ecosystem, the partners, and everyone around that. So I got to ask you, final question. You got a growing team, doing well, but good quarter, good logos mm -hmm. adding, winning the high end the enterprise. Feel good. Notice you got a new VP of engineering, Matt Morgan, came over from HP at Citrix. Uh, seen his name on around, kicking around. Uh -huh. um, good team developing. What's the update inside Hortonworks? Give us the stats. Employees, new additions, uh, changes. Yeah, so a couple things. So we had uh, we had Matt join us right from Citrix to go run product marketing, and he's doing an awesome job, right? Going to build that out. 
know, we're about 750 people now. We operate in 18 different countries, so we've expanded all through Europe and Asia, right, in terms of what we're doing there. Right, we still follow everything around open source. And John Christ is study. running international, so you have now international leader. Absolutely, in we have marketing. a leader running international, running Europe and Asia, and running that in teams in all those theaters, and teams being field teams, support teams, and engineering teams in all of those theaters, right, all across the U.S. and you know, separated in different places across the U.S. So we're getting very broad, which is good. Yeah. And this is again, how do you make those customers successful and go deep with them? When you look at the Apache Software Foundation, when the history books are written, what's your view, what will be said about Apache Software Foundation in terms of its impact and the technology industry? I think what people are going to go back and look and say, the governance model of the ASF and what they've done has allowed an industry to flourish and to foster under a confined set of um, parameters in terms of how they do that. And it's allowed everyone to participate, but do it in a controlled way that you've got a model for how to go develop software for the future. And I think you're going to see this continue time and time again with other technologies. Yeah, and I think it's certainly changed the game. You look at all the players, EMC, IBM, you guys are in, I mean, vendors are playing with coders, it's all, it's really working. So yeah. I think they're and formal. We are very deep with the Apache Software Foundation in terms of believing in its mission and working with it. Right? And everything we've done is, how do we go do our upstream work in Apache? You know, now we have ODP as a downstream way of consuming that and packaging yeah. it to a standardized <laughs> railroad track. Right? Yeah. But upstream, all that works done yeah. in Apache. As Mr. Reardon said, there's a railroad and electricity. Mm -hmm. Two utilities out mm -hmm. there. It's good to be a utility. It's good to be a utility. You know? yeah, it means everyone can just plug into it every single day, right? President of Hortonworks here inside theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>